on a podcast called uh, Dub Jelly Slim Podcast. First ever type 1 diabetic in UFC history. Uh, doing fine, Dub. Nice to be with you. Get out! <laughs> like, yeah. My tunnel vision and my periphery, I'm like all field. Hey, you know how it is, Dub. Hey, when you're, hey, when you're team. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's crazy. What's up, everyone? We're back with another episode of Dub Jelson Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Eric Swope. Eric, how are you? Doing fantastic, man. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, just to get started, how, how are you feeling with your leg? I know uh, back in April you had your injury um, as a part of the Spring Football League. Um, so how's that uh, rehab process been going and how are you feeling? Yeah, so I um, was actually going into Memorial Week and I broke my fibula and dislocated my ankle. So it was a bit of a gruesome injury and um, things are going well, man. I had my surgery a few weeks ago. I got my cast off. Uh, this past Tuesday. So I'm in a walking boot and just kind of slowly get my range of motion back. And honestly, things are going quite well. Of course, you know, with any unpredictable, especially gruesome injury, you don't know how you're going to partake in it. And when it impacts you, it impacts everyone and, you know, family, friends, so on and so forth. So I've definitely, not that I felt like I needed a reminder, but I definitely feel loved and supported and um, yeah, we're on the right track. Mm, How, I mean, you talked about the family, the family aspect and how it's impacting them just how much do they have to do for you i've never had a a leg injury like that or or anything along those lines how much help do you need um in the very early stages pre-surgery it was pretty much you name it i needed help with it um now that i've gotten myself uh, off crutches onto a knee scooter um things have gone i'm basically able to take care of myself a lot more Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, in the very early stages, when I got back from the spring league, my fiance and my mom was in town and, you know, from cooking to cleaning, I had to order a a shower chair. You have to cover your leg with a bag. It's, uh, it's not a pretty process, but I felt very loved and very cared for by, you know, by again, like I said, my family, my fiance, they were, I haven't felt like I've missed anything. (laughs) Uh, fair enough. Um, I mean, when, when I, whenever I look at athletes, especially in the NFL, I mean, in football in general, you guys get hurt all the time. And I feel like fans don't really, I mean, they're like, oh, that dude's always hurt. Don't, don't sign him, like cut him or what, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, but how much of a struggle is it mentally and emotionally for, I mean, you and um, all the rest of the guys, when you do have a, a gruesome injury or um, your injury plate or uh, how be it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a interesting challenge. You know, the one thing I've learned kind of as I've gone through the different um, levels of sport is the higher the level, the more isolating it is, because in order to be, you know, one of the let's say one percent of all athletes to make it to these high levels, what you have to put yourself in just to be in the category, just to be competitive in the category, it's a lot of stress. It's a lot on the body and then mentally because you're going to miss birthdays, you're going to miss parties, you're going to miss social outings or things that, you know, maybe everyone you know is experiencing. And for some, that's very challenging. For others, that's how it's preferred. And that's kind of how, you know, when I've been in in my time in Indy meeting different guys in the locker room, yeah, like some handled it, say one way, some handled it the other. And, um, And then when it does come to a huge injury, those are the moments, especially, like I said, when you get to the pros, it's now on you or your camp to get yourself right. Because to what makes you the best professional, right, is you at your best. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you want to be a terrific teammate, but to be a terrific teammate, you need to be healthy. So it's like dancing this fine line where everything that you've been told your entire life as a collegiate athlete, if this is an amateur athlete playing team sports, is be there for your guys, no matter what, you know, give your all, so on and so forth, which is true. Don't get me wrong. But when you get to the professional level, when you're actually trying to feed your family, if you have to essentially do what you have to do to make sure that you're healthy, there's like this weird paradigm shift where it's like, actually, if I'm more selfish, it's technically better. So it was something that I didn't expect when I got to the NFL that that was going to be a mental stressor. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, the, the mental game is 
shoot more in the physical game. If you can keep yourself in check, when we see the athletes that we love, the folks that you have on your fantasy teams and so forth, when they make those big plays, the, the cool thing about being in that, that 1% of guys is every single one of those guys can make those plays. A lot of it, the difference you'll see between a, a, a all pro versus someone who's getting cut up and down, maybe their mental health. It may be just where they are and how focused and how, you know, how well they're able to stay in the moment when those moments arise. So one of those moments being adversity, injury. Mm -hmm. And how are you kind of able to balance that um, during your playing days? So I always, um, pretty much since high school, have done a great deal of yoga and meditation. Always, anything I can do to look within. I've always tried to back that up with seeing some type of third party mental health specialist, whether that's a sports psychologist or just your general style, because no, I don't have anything diagnosable, but we're all human. We're all going through things. Even, you know, like you feel like, oh, because you're an Indianapolis Colt, it should all just stars should align. But we all know that that's not the truth. And I think mm -hmm. all sport entities are kind of starting to share their stories with mental health always since college I've always seen someone whether it's once a week twice a week um, in India I used to see uh, Dr. Elizabeth White and I believe she still works with the team um, but I think I've seen maybe four or five folks and uh, it was kind of a very early conversation because I haven't I've been doing more me on the meditation aspect where I'm currently at but after this injury I was like oh yeah this is definitely a time no matter what happens moving forward I'm going to start a channel to work, you know, with someone third party. I think it's just an amazing space. I think no matter who you are, or what you have going on, it's very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think as time, as time has gone on and mental health has kind of been brought to the forefront, um, you see a lot of these athletes that we all look up to when we were kids or peers or uh, what have it, um, they're coming out and sharing their stories, which I think is uh, super impactful. Um, I mean, recently you just saw the Colts with the, the Break the Stigma campaign. Um, when, when you first kind of got into the league or, I mean, even in college, was there a stigma around it? Like if someone was kind of going through something where they looked down upon at all? Um, coming Because my background was a little bit more basketball, not saying that the sports football has more of like an animalistic mentality. We all know that. That's just the truth. So in the basketball world was kind of my first time seeing guys feeling family pressure to be successful. Luckily, oh, sorry, got a couple cats in here. Um, <laughs> and they were just being busy. Luckily, the locker room that I was in was one of the more free flowing where guys could really share their pains and, you know, their, their good and bad. So no, it wasn't necessarily held against you, but what I say, there was a stigma in sports that no matter what's going on, you should be able to see through it and just be on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where it's been cool to see how these guys are trying to navigate the conversation because it's subjective, essentially person by person. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know um, how it's impacting them and how it's impacting those around you. And I will say the more I've been around guys there's been more of a willingness to share and to, to talk about that. And I think as, as men in general, kind of our previous generation told us to just be tough guys. And we're finding out that there's obviously a lot more to that story and toughness is seen in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as someone who's, who's dealt with battles before, um, I feel like it's super important that you guys do that. And I mean, I thank you on behalf of, of everybody um, just for, I mean, you and just everyone who kind of puts themselves out there and speaks freely about it, not necessarily coming out and saying every little thing that's ever happened to them or yeah. sharing their entire story, keeping it private, but still talking about it. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like you said, you look at your heroes or, or folks that you just generally respect and um, to find out that they're human too, I think grows the respect to find out that like, in their biggest moments, they were genuinely as scared as you thought it looked, or they have some crazy way to put fear behind them. I think 
or wh whatever it may be. I think it's just a, a cool topic that you can add into the experience of being a fan of sports. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to kind of see where that conversation continues to go. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it a couple minutes ago, um, how you came up through basketball. And that was one of the really interesting things um, about you, obviously, your journey from playing basketball at Miami to then being in the NFL. Um, so what has it been like to experience all these things and kind of just go through this journey? It's reminded me that within our human mind sphere, you just can't fathom what's going to come next. And as long as you are open and willing to, to take risks and take gambles on yourself and really believe that what you bring to the table is valid and worthy and that you're willing to sacrifice doesn't really matter what the title's called or the way it goes if you really want something you can make something happen I think I always wanted to be in the NBA but at the end of the day I always wanted to be a professional athlete so I wanted to study Yes, the players I respected, the Kobe Bryants, the Shaqs, the, you know, the Andre Giants, all or Andre Johnson, excuse me, of this world, these people that I greatly, greatly respected. But the thing that I found myself more um, almost interested in was the way that they carried themselves, like meeting Andrew Luck, which me coming from basketball, I had heard the name, didn't really know anything about him. And then I get to Indy and of course, with the Colts, it's, it's very quarterback centric because they had Peyton Manning mm -hmm. and Johnny Unitas. And, you know, it's this big deal. And then I meet this guy. Oh, my God, you're going to get a chance to play with Andrew Luck. And I'm like, um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. But up until that point, when I was at University in Miami, one of the really cool things um, that happened all my four years there is so – during our off season, which is also the NBA off season, the guys would come to Miami for a variety of reasons. What have a good time vacation, or they'd come there to train. And the practice facility at university of Miami would have basically an open door policy for NBA guys. Mm -hmm. So I had a chance when I was there to see, I mean, you name it from Kevin Durant to LeBron James to whoever I got to see guys in a training aspect, something that, you know, fans don't get a chance to see. I got to see like, how does LeBron James stay focused on his game when he's considered the pinnacle athlete of today's sports and get to see his dedication, his commitment to the things he needs to work on, his commitment to the things he knows he's good at. And one of the things that I was starting to, to learn was that's what a professional looks like. That's a professional has a certain degree of charisma, character, respect. Like when LeBron came, he had signed with the Miami Heat. Um, I think that was my, freshman year well, it's been a while but he came to Miami introduced himself as LeBron it's like well yeah dude of course we know what you are but still shove your hand look you dead in your face hi my name is LeBron James how are you doing hi, my name is Eric Swope and then he came the next day to work out with us and he knew everyone's name again he came in hey Eric how you doing and it's like why would he have taken time I don't know if he has a photographic memory or whatever but at some point in his day, he took time to know the 15 guys on University of Miami's 2010 roster mm -hmm. to, to just do that pleasantry. And how much that meant for me, it was like, if I ever got a chance to just show respect to someone, regardless of stature or anything, I want to embody that because that is what a professional looks like. So I fell more in love with like, that realm and then in that as I went through the journey and switched sports it was just so cool to see the pinnacle athletes in the NBA and in the NFL how they carry themselves what their training mechanisms are and then just trying to embody that for myself so going into a sport with you know I have zero knowledge and zero confidence but everyone keeps telling me I'm going to be successful so it's like uh, so how do I do that? <laughs> so it was really just a crazy crash course of kind of like naive confidence and just all the things that I had kind of studied in the people that I respected. Just try and see how that communicated with me as I, you know, spent my time. Mm -hmm.
and I mean, before I move on to the next point, uh, I had Katie Gerald on my podcast. She's the, she's going to be the Purdue head women's basketball coach. And she played with LeBron at the McDonald's all American oh. game in 2003. So she oh, said she cool. was playing. Okay. So she was playing for Purdue. I think it was three years later and they're playing in the NCAA tournament in Cleveland. And she hears KG, KG. And she turns around and it was LeBron who oh, remembered okay. her from, from all those years later. I mean, it's just three years, but still, I mean, that dude's top of the food chain and what he does. Um, so it kind of speaks to the type of person he is. But sure. what was it like to see the different, I mean, kind of mindsets or approaches to training? Like you mentioned, LeBron and Kevin Durant. And then you go to the NFL and you see guys like Andrew Luck. So how, how different are their mindsets in terms of training and improving themselves? So there's a, I mean, there's, of course, there's basics. Uh, you know, basketball, you play offense and defense. So there's already, you narrow your scope. The interesting thing was just, it kind of felt like in basketball, because you generally all work at the same things, you could kind of hop into any level of training. And yes, it may be a little bit more position specific, but it was freer. We're like, as a tight end, I'm not going to go work out with kickers we have nothing in common like there's nothing that we do from a training aspect and it was just so interesting to switch from a i call basketball sport of flow and football chess with human beings that's kind of like the way i see it and to go into something where you could truly have a very like narrow scope of skills but if you could do them at the highest level in the biggest moments you could tr like you could change the whole trajectory of a game you could change your life and it was just like trying to understand like okay and worry about it's just like lift run eat sleep <laughs> i'm like this is just I, which is the same I did in basketball, but there was just something, you know, I shoot, then I work on this, then I work on that. And football, it was just like, get really strong, get really fast, make sure your mental health's right, eat, sleep. And being around like T.Y. and Robert Mathis and some of these guys when I first got there, because my first year there when I was on practice squad, which was awesome, because it was like the greatest football internship of your entire life, because that year was when we went to the AFC championship. Mm -hmm. So I just came in kind of assuming like, oh, yeah, so we, the Colts just win. We just win. It's that simple. I'm like, oh, this is pretty awesome. Like, first year in and we're one game outside the Super Bowl. Like, this is how it's going to be. Like, wow, I lucked out going undrafted to like a winning team. And then to see, you know, how the tides change and guys retire and trades and seeing all those different things, um, getting into the training, it was so, again, specific. If you were good at these five routes, but you needed to work on your blocking, then like those five routes, you need to be not just good. You need to be like Hall of Fame good. And then in the meantime, you can work on those other things. And it was the, the specificity of it was kind of mind boggling because in my first couple of years when the season was over and I'd go to play basketball and I only played like a couple of times just because I, I put on 40 pounds my rookie year. So I was like, oh, I don't think I'm, I think basketball is over. But the, the, one of the first times I played, it was just like, Going from a sport of flow where one call, you could potentially call the entire game and it might literally work like the pick and roll is and you can't defend it. So you can just run a pick and roll the whole basketball game. You can't do that in football. There's different personnel and blah, blah, blah. So knowing that like that one play that you have wanted your coaches to call for you is about to be called, that's your one shot, especially because I was never like a starting star or nothing like that. I was second, third, tight end, whatever it was based off this game and this game plan. So if I got my one call, this is my one chance to get a dunk, to get a touchdown, to make a play, to do something to impact the game. And just the level of specified training so that that specific play went exactly like it would in practice and on paper. Just think about how much focus went into like, you know, on a, on a piece of paper, it's just up and to the left. Mm -hmm. But like so many factors happen for that to go perfectly. So when I went and played basketball, 
I, it was like I was playing pickup with my brother at like one of the YMCA's in in, a, in Indy, and uh, we were down like a couple of points, and it was just like the ability that I could just like hone in that like we have five points to score. I can picture all five baskets. Like it's kind of funny, but I was like, yeah, I couldn't do that in, in basketball. I couldn't get that degree of like commitment that like this one exact drive or this one play is gonna change the game so it was cool to see there was a lot of similarities don't get me wrong the diet's just different it's basically just more consumption because you need to be bigger um the training you know nuts and bolts were very similar just more weight but um again yeah just that that very specific training that you can make the smallest changes um really revealed themselves as i was around the guys in the locker room I mean, if you could do it all again, starting from the beginning, uh, from the day you step on um, to Miami's campus, would you change anything? Probably not. Um, the only thing, I think some of the way I would have handled my personal, um, like basketball training in my first couple of years, um, I spent too much time trying to figure out how to be a good teammate rather than just doing the things I knew I needed to do. And I kind of dropped the act when I went into my senior year and just said, look, I know the things I'm good at. I know the things that got me here. I need to work on those. And I know what else I need to work on because I've seen myself on tape. Mm -hmm. And I was a little too concerned with, oh my God, I'm in the ACC. What does an ACC college basketball player do as opposed to just doing the things I knew worked for me? And it took me longer than, you know, in a perfect world, it took me longer than I would have necessarily wanted to, to figure out that what I was doing in high school, I could have just continued to do. So that would probably be about the only thing I'd change. Um, aside from that, you know, when we go through the, the experience of life, we plan for the successes. We don't know when the hardships are coming, like this injury I'm dealing with right now. I never would have pictured what I experienced, but that, you know, that's what makes us, right? That's what makes you, you. That's what makes me, me. So I wouldn't want a cookie cutter experience. I preferred to go to University of Miami because I knew the odds were against me, because I was the only guy from California, because I knew that people thought that basketball players from California wouldn't be able to stand in the ACC. Those were the things that motivated me when I was 17, 18 years old. And I know the 17 year, 18 year old me, if I told him how it went, he'd be like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna try and do it better then. So yeah, I'm sticking to it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there is, there's definitely no cookie cutter way of, of doing any one thing in my opinion. Like for me, this podcast, I mean, it, it was kind of a, just happened. Like I, I watched a UFC fight one night, John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson too. And then mm -hmm. that led me into, watching the Joe Rogan experience and that led me into enjoying podcasts. And then I turned it into this and it's, I would have like, if someone told me six months before, like, Hey, in a couple of years, you're going to have a podcast. You're going to have on Eric Swope, Dwight Freeney, all these people. I'd have been like, nah, I mean, I don't see myself doing that, but no shot. it's just, <laughs> <My little one>. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say like, I appreciate how you say, like, there's no cookie. You didn't want a cookie cutter way. No, no. I, from, so the high school that I went to that got me to Miami was a hundred miles from where I grew up. And I had a huge application process. I actually had to take a six hour exam to get into the school. And it was so outside of my norm that when I first got there, I was just like, I don't see myself succeeding, but the only thing I wanted was to be challenged. So I said, whether it looks the way I thought it was gonna go, I wanted to be a freshman on varsity. I was the second freshman on my high school's varsity team in the school's history. So I said, I'm here, this is what I wanted. It didn't look the way I thought, but this is what I wanted. So I need to figure out a way to make it mine. And that's what you've done with this podcast. And that's what I've tried to do with my journey. And yeah, this is just not what I thought was going to happen. I'm not even going to pretend that, like, I, I didn't even watch football. Like, to put it in perspective, like, 
my in college I tailgated a handful of times and I was lucky if I even stayed through halftime because I was like I don't know what's going on I, it's not fun to watch because I don't know what I'm looking at and then I just leave with my buddies because I'm like yeah I supported my teammate like I, you know I supported my buddies on campus but to think that fast forward that I go to the NFL and in competing with those guys that I used to like halfway you know, stick to the games with and completely give up the thing I've been doing since I was five years old. Mm -mm, definitely not. But I, I mean, I've loved this journey. This journey has brought me my fiance has brought, you know, cool and different opportunities to my family, to my friends, new conversations, new people, podcasts, like things that I would have never even thought that I'd be a part of where I'm getting folks wanting to know my story because it made help someone with what they're going on like that's so cool and i wouldn't change like you know like you said with 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 what you've done i wouldn't change that because at the end of the day it is what something that you want to do something that i wanted to do it's just not in the picture that my little brain thought it was going to go yeah back when you were little <laughs> um, yeah when i was little yeah um so i kind of want to get in briefly get into kind of the the transformation from playing at Miami to then go into the NFL. Uh, what was okay. that moment where you kind of, you were like, Hey, this is something I might want to pursue is I'm assuming someone probably told you. Yeah. So the way the story goes <laughs> is my senior year. Um, we lost to NC state in the ACC tournament. It was like second round. It was early. We, we had a tough season. Um, and I went to Coach L, Coach Laranega, and I told – basically, he would have a meeting with the seniors and um, say, you know, you're about to graduate. What do you want to do with your life? And my class um, – we had three scholarship and one walk-on. And basically, the three guys were like, hey, you know, my, my buddy Justin, who's actually now my financial manager, was going to go into grad school. My other uh, – you know, Europe and I was and yep so my plan is I don't think the NBA is calling you know I want to go overseas and continue a career in basketball so, okay sounds good we'll follow up with you we're going to kind of like reconvene and see how we can help so then on the flight back to Miami um, they followed up with each senior and kind of gave their two cents on their perspective and so I'm finishing up talking with Coach L about playing and what and he says okay I got something weird to like, just take it for what it is. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what had happened was my senior year, I had gotten on and I'm, I'm just assuming this is the way it went, but I had gotten on sports center a number of times for like acrobatic dunks, basically high pointing a basketball. Mm -hmm. And I got the attention of the NFL because uh, guys like Jimmy Graham and Tony Gonzalez and some of these different and you know Antonio Gates these different folks that have transitioned and had a great deal of success so teams were kind of starting to shop some of their smaller scouts to keep an eye on tweeners or the six four six five not quite a power forward not quite a small forward type basketball player and see if they have what they deemed as football traits so that's what I was told is that a scout from the Denver Broncos and this was the year so this was uh, 14, so end of the 13 season. So it was the year that the Broncos got beat pretty bad by the Seahawks. So I'm sitting on the plane like, so you mean to tell me I've never played a, a down of football and the Super Bowl runner up now wants me to join and play with Peyton Man? <laughs> like, you got to be kidding me. So I thought it was hilarious, honestly, when I first heard it. And um, I had always been the first person. I don't know if I've ever actually said this like on record but the first person that suggested that I should play football was Keyshawn Johnson he probably doesn't remember this at all I was playing pickup basketball in Calabasas and they have like a little men's youth or like a youth center and that's where one of the like hidden basketball runs are in California mm -hmm. and um I was playing uh with a bunch of guys it was actually like Mitch Richmond Michael Clark Duncan randomly rest in peace a bunch of random folks there and uh, I was playing against Keyshawn, and he pulled me to the side after one of the games and was like, what are you doing on a basketball court? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm, I was in high school. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm playing basketball just like you are. And he was like, son, your future is football. 
So uh, you can cut the act and put on some pads. And I just kind of was like, I mean, I respect you a lot because I know you're a tremendous success and a USC talent and like, thanks dude. But yeah, I'm going to go back to shooting. And I just cared about my business. And my brother happened to be there who again was my roommate in college. So fast forward to, I get off the plane and I get back to my apartment and I tell my brother like, dude, you wouldn't believe it. Coach said that uh, NFL teams are now calling. He's like, well, at least got to see where it goes. So I ended up, the day I got this call and called the scout back and said, okay, like, what are we going to do? And he basically said, we're going to do a pro day. Mm -hmm. um, the day I got that call was Miami's pro day. And in my mind, it'd be disrespectful to the guys at that graduation class for me to hop in their pro day because they've worked their lives for this and I'm just winging it. So I was like, okay, let's, I don't want to go to the pro day. Let's do like another week, just like a random because honestly if I suck I don't really want people to know that I'm terrible so let's just keep this like real <laughs> kind of on the down low and he's like yeah sure totally so he came out the following week um so I spent seven days that was my entire NFL prep was seven days of like catching drills with my brother and like some light prep for the 225 bench press like because I had done the 185, which was the NBA one, and I had bench pressed like 25 times the 185. So I'm like, I feel like I'd be okay at 225. I don't know. So we fast forward that week. I did a full combine, bra, you know, all the stuff that you see at the, you know, at the combine. And what hit me is that, you know, everything was hand time, nothing was laser. But after the measurables, the numbers I had put up would have made me the number one tight end coming out. And then I ran routes with our quarterback that was at the time, Stephen Morris, who's now a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and he, when he was throwing to me, I caught every single pass, every single route. And I was like, okay, well, seven days prep would have made me the, the number one tight end coming out. I think other than bench press was the only thing I didn't like, I wasn't either first or like third in because I think I did 14 reps and guys were doing it in the 20s but I like the scout taught me a 40 stance and I ran a 457 so I'm like he told me if you ran over 48 we'll try and you know turn you into a DN if you ran like four fours to four sixes tight end and sub four four we'll try and turn you into a wide out so I was right in the tight end category mm -hmm. and then after that workout coincidentally it was Miami's I didn't know this but it was Miami's final spring practice so all of the media was there to interview guys that were you know going into their next season so they see me who they've been interviewing and in, you know across the street you know at, at our basketball stadium they see me walking out with an NFL scout and like hmm weird so some things had like kind of leaked out and then my brother was like well you know it went well let's let's make you a Twitter and because I didn't have one at the time and uh, tweeted the NFL, just tweeted like major publication, it, you know, NFL, ESPN, Fox Sports, just say you're entering your name in the draft. And let's just see if we can get you one more workout, just so in case if the Broncos just say they're not interested, you at least got one other chance because who knows what may happen. So I, if you go to my Twitter and go to my very first tweet, it's me saying I'm entering my name in the draft. I have no idea what that means. I ended up, um, working out with 14 teams and interviewing with 27 after I wrote that tweet. It's the one time in my life that social media actually posed the benefit. And when it was all said and done, um, Indianapolis, there was no question was going to be the best suited fit for me. Um, you know, they were at the time a young team on the brink with this awesome quarterback who was very open-minded to throwing the ball to anybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, Based on my mentor, who is Jimmy Graham, who uh, that's a whole nother story, but he was kind of the person that took me under his wing and taught me everything he knows as much as he was willing to give, which I'm forever thankful for. Um, and I used to train with him for years. We trained together. Um, and through in respect with the, our conversations and all that, Indy was going to be the good fit. And yeah, man, that's how I got there. And it was literally like, 
the way it went was I did all those workouts. Then I finished my finals. Then it was my birthday. Then I went undrafted. And then on Monday, I was in Indianapolis. It was that quick. That's crazy. Four days. I didn't even get a chance to celebrate graduating. Like, I was like, all right, family, I guess I'm signing with the Colts. And I thought I was going to literally sign a document and go home. So I packed, like, a weekend's worth of clothes. And then I was there for all of OTAs. I didn't know what OTAs was. <laughs> so they said, prepare yourself for OTAs. And I said, how much did I pack? And they're like, oh, you know, a decent bit. So I was like, okay, maybe this is like, because they said, like, mini camp and all that was coming up. I'm like, oh, mini camp, mini. So that probably means, like, you know, three, four days. That's how much I packed. I was there for 10 weeks. <laughs> and absolutely- Yeah, it was a crash course. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, one of those, like, I didn't even, I hadn't even fathomed that I finished college because I now was handed an iPad with hundreds of plays and expectations that I should know these by like, you know, yesterday. Hmm. Like, so how many people are on the field? <laughs> That's where I was at when, when I first got there. So, yeah. It's like yeah. trying to teach it like, like at Purdue, we have a lot of international students. And mm-hmm. like, I remember freshman year, they'd come to the football games. They wouldn't know what the heck was going on. So you'd have to like try to explain in. I don't know. I thought, I think it's funny for you to be actually on the team. Like, I don't know. That's just insane to me. Um, I know we're running short on time. We might have oh. to over, but. Oh, you're good. Um, I want to kind of talk, obviously I'm an Indianapolis Colts fan, uh, born and raised. So when, when you got there, how did the locker room treat you? Because you're kind of like an outsider coming on, coming in. And did it make, make things easier that guys like Daniel Dongo, Ross Travis, and um, you know, the end of your time with the Colts Mo Alley Cox also um, kind of had the same ish path? Yeah, so that was a big fear when I first got there, especially because of um, amateur to pro that these folks don't need to care about me at all the coolest thing I experienced was from Andrew to Vinny to Pat to all those guys the guys on defense were very straight up with me you can help us win I don't care where you're from what you did or what you do just make sure when you're here your commitment is to help us win and that was I heard that from Reggie Robert Vinny Pat Andrew Everyone, Costanzo, everyone that was there, Art Jones, like everyone that was there said the same exact thing to me. Like, dude, I don't care. Just make the play when they make the call and we'll be good. And I'm like, cool. And then I just committed myself to saying, you know, they, one of the big stories that they kind of tell young rookies when they first get to the NFL Um, or at least they did in Indianapolis, was pick a vet that you respect and basically speak to them about their process. And even if you don't want to do that, if you're just not ready to have that conversation, just see what time they get in the building, see what time they leave, see when they come for film, see when they lift, and just start embodying that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I actually did with Reggie Wayne. Because he was one of the guys in off-season program didn't have to be there. So all off season, where is this Reggie guy that everyone keeps telling me about? Because because there was a lot of University of Miami alumni that were on the coaching staff when I first got there, and they all keep talking about Reggie. And I would, you know, as most football fans, you see him in a jersey and a helmet. So when we watch tape, that's what I saw. And I'm like, I see Ty. Where's Reggie? I didn't know he's like you know the gold in 14 years at the time and all that. Like I didn't know any of that stuff. So I'm just like. Where's this guy everyone talk about? And then I met him at veteran mini camp. I'm like, ah, oh, that's the guy. Cause everyone in the locker room was like ecstatic that he was there and he was just larger than life. But his process was unbelievable. And then when Frank Gore and Andre Johnson came, it was like that same thing. So those guys were all very much about as long as you take care of business, it doesn't matter. And the cool thing was, is the staff kind of helped or, yeah, they helped as I got more educated in the game. Um, when Mo in specific uh, came to Indy, I was actually one of the folks that 
essentially recruited him because I told him like, well, look, dude, like they're not going to judge you. It's as simple as what I've been saying. Just come here and, and, and do your job and guys will embrace you. And he was kind of like, all right, I guess I come to Andy. And then with Ross, Ross had been in Kansas city. Um, and it was very similar experience for him. You know, it was kind of like, he's behind Travis Kelsey and learning from a great player. And the guys were like, yeah, just show up and show out. It was the same with Daniel, Daniel Dongo, who was my locker mate at the time. And he was trying to kind of figure out which way to navigate. And yeah, as long as you make your plays, especially in that game where you only get a finite amount of opportunities, um, you could kind of see through if your background is a funky one, that's fine. As long as you do your assignment and those guys really, really embraced me and challenged me. And when they kind of saw that I, I had a, a willing commitment to do whatever I had to do. Um, one person I want to give a humongous shout out because I am his biggest, greatest, largest fan is Jack Doyle. He was and is my football best friend, big brother, all that. Between him and Andrew, and I also developed a very close relationship with Pat and Benny, those kind of like four guys really helped me feel like I belonged, not only in the NFL, but as a member of the Colts. And Jack, from the day-to-day tight end grind of like understanding how do you do this and I got to meet him as the third tight end special teamer and see him become a pro bowler he's like I anytime I watch a Colts game I'm just like come on Jack <laughs> let's go Jack like, he is my favorite human being I know he is beloved and he's got you know everyone in Indianapolis loves him but I'll say from being firsthand every single day with him and his loving wife and kids like He's an amazing human being. And like, I just feel lucky that I got to spend some time with him because he, this journey would be way different if I wasn't Jack Doyle's teammate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Colts, the Colts really have, I mean, from the outside looking in, feels like a real tight knit community within the locker room. And I mean, I don't really pay attention to all the other teams Mm -hmm. um, per se. And like, as far as that dynamic, but I mean, the Colts, I mean, even now with Frank Reich and Chris Ballard, it kind of feels the same way as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, though, was did having someone like Andrew Luck as your quarterback, a, a mastermind, number one overall pick, I mean, you can go down the list. Did it make the move kind of easier to learn? Absolutely, because he's so smart and his expectations were so high that in my mind, just my competitive spirit, I could, I, I felt that I'm like, okay. So he's telling me if I do exactly what he's saying and make sure I just know the calls and the adjustments, basically he rewards me with the football, no questions asked. And when he would run meetings and different things like that, one, when he'd go, I mean, it's like he'd turn on the tape, the tape hasn't even started and he could tell you 500 ways to, to yeah, I was like, I've, I've never met like a, bigger football mind there's a reason why he was the number one overall pick um on top of the fact he's just a brilliant human being you know outside of the game but his willingness to or I'll say his competitive drive to give everyone an opportunity I don't I get the vibe because I haven't been on you know many other teams I've been camp with a couple others but I get the vibe that's not normal Mm -hmm. that like you could be a guy that signed five days ago, but if you run a post route better than whoever and you're open, you're going to get the ball. Like, I don't get, you know, just off watching game flow, you don't really see that. Yeah. And typically when you see that is in championship quarterbacks, right? When they, you know, they show the stat, nine guys have had catches over 10 yards in this game. Like, that's just like Andrew any given day where you really knew when you were out there, if you studied and he'd say it, if you apply yourself, I will give you opportunities. But if you don't apply yourself, you won't sniff this ball. <laughs> and he, it was real. Like, you know, you would see 
a guy like Chester Rogers, an undrafted guy, just trying to figure out his way. And then all of a sudden he's becoming a third down target, the most crucial part of the drive, right? To sustain mm -hmm. it. And he's going to you when he's got TY and all these different folks, but he's giving you a look because he likes the way you run that route. And it's like, you know, as a fan, you're like, why aren't you throwing the ball to TY? Or why aren't you throwing the ball to Jack? Or why aren't you throwing the ball to some, you know, franchise favorite? But he trusted in his team and in his teammates. And I will forever respect him for that because I always wondered, you know, obviously the quarterback position has more pressure than any job I think in sports. And like for him to have the, the, the trust and freedom in his own teammates to give everyone a chance, like that's where Sundays were just like, whoo, today might be my day. You just didn't know. Like if he just was filling it and you were running good routes and you're just going to see the ball the whole game. So he definitely, I can't, I, I just don't know if I was somewhere else, if it would have gone as smooth as it did. Um, don't get me wrong. It was definitely a lot of growing pains to get to the moment to be able to, you know, make some plays. But um, he and all of his skill and ability made the process a very smooth one. When, when, you, first, when you caught that first touchdown pass, what was going through your mind? Like, I know, like, in the moment, you're probably not even thinking about it. You're just like, oh, I'm catching a touchdown pass. But, like, after, like, when you get to the sidelines, like, what's going through your mind? So when the ball was in the air, the only thing I was thinking was just, like, catch, tuck, catch, tuck, <laughs> catch, tuck. <laughs> because, like, I had been dreaming of this moment and obviously had no idea if it ever even come into fruition. And on the, the game in Minnesota – and we had, it was the first time I kind of earned some plays that were going to be called in my favor. Not only did the plays work, but Andrew also was throwing the ball to me in tight windows that actually, if you look on tape, I wasn't supposed to get the ball. So it, that didn't occur to me until I got to the sideline with my tight end coach. But the plays that were in the playbook, quote unquote, for me, we ran them all. And the last one was my touchdown. And it was just like in the heat of the moment, um, it was actually the first game that I wasn't stressed. I was just like, look, it's week 12. I've been doing this for months now. Like, just go play. You're going to be fine. And it was the first time, yeah, I wasn't like panicked. Like, oh, man, just make sure I know this last one. And then I ended up having some of my best games. And then, yeah, when I got to the sideline and everybody hitting your helmet and other guys that um, – because Indianapolis is one of the few places where undrafted guys can make – you know, statistically make the active roster year in, year out. So I had a, a, a great friend of mine, teammate of mine, Zach Kerr, who was my locker mate at the time. And we used to always joke about, hey, man, we're the undrafted free agents that are, you know, making it happen and sticking it up for the 2014 class. And he was the first person that came and was, you know, ecstatic for me. And it's cool because Sports Center caught pictures of him like jumping and hitting my helmet and all that. And it's just such a fond memory of like Jimmy Graham had always told me that when you score your first touchdown, it's going to feel better than any dunk you've ever had in a basketball game. And I had just been waiting to see what he was talking about. And when it happened, I think I think I scored in the second quarter my heart rate didn't calm down until maybe like the fourth. I just like couldn't believe it happened. It was like, stay locked in. You might score again, dude. Like <laughs> I was like trying to get there, but yeah, dude, it was just one of the, and then, you know, Andrew support and Dwayne Allen's and Jack. I mean, like all these guys were, it was awesome, dude. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I want to wrap this up soon. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go too long, uh, but I mean, obviously, that was a very memorable moment. Uh, what are some of the other ones that kind of stick out to you during your, your time in the NFL? I mean, yeah. whether it be on the field, personal, team. Yeah, so, well, one that has probably gotten more publicity than I would have ever expected was when Pat McAfee threw me the fake in the Steelers game because I don't – I think he normally shares it, but – uh, yeah, we literally drew it up like, I don't know, an hour before the game. We like were running backyard football type stuff? Backyard football type stuff. Like our special teams guy, we, were, we, we said we're going to do rugby punt. And then like our kind of like wrap it up meeting. He's like, all right, I got an idea. 
basically if we don't get any edge pressure on, cause I was like the last guy on the rugby formation. Mm. He said, if no one rushes, you come tell me next time Pat's throwing it. And he was like, understand if you tell me that Pat's throwing it, it's not like a, if, <laughs> you know, if then like, Pat is throwing the ball, so don't make me look bad. And I was just like, okay, no pressure. It's just Thanksgiving game against Pittsburgh Steelers. Whole world's watching. And we just drew this one up, sure. And uh, the friggin' play worked. <laughs> Still like, boom. Like, I just couldn't believe because I, you know, took off running and I couldn't see Pat. And then all of a sudden the ball appeared and it was like, oh, I got to go get it. And the guy was like right on my butt. I finally break it and like take off running. I didn't even realize that Antonio Brown was the one that ended up making the tackle. And that's where Pat still gives me a hard time. He's like, how did you not score a touchdown? It was like in the heat of the moment. I never even thought that the ball was going to even like, and he threw like a perfect tight spiral, like an Andrew level throw. And I was just kind of like running, like, um, did he get hit? Anything like all the things went through my mind and just suddenly the ball just like appeared on like a perfect angle. And it was just like, get the most you can, get the most you can, get the most you can. Like don't fumble. Cause we finally have like a good fake that, you know, we ran. So that's definitely one. Um, the last one game related was um, my fiance is Colts fans won't like this, but she's a big Patriots fan. Her grandfather is from Boston um, so she's been a Patriots fan for forever and ever and ever. And in 2018, my final season in Indy, we went there for Thursday night football. And that was a tough season for me because I was coming back from my knee injury and blah, blah, blah. Ended up being cut the week prior, uh, the Houston game, and then had a short week to re-sign and study to play the New England Patriots, who I had never played before. And we all know when Tom Brady's Patriots, what that experience is like, it's a tough one. And we were beat up from playing Houston the previous week. And when I got in the locker room and got around Andrew and all that, and he's like, look, I know you weren't here last week, but it's time to go. I'm like, you got it. And that was the first time I brought my fiance to a game with me, to a road game, because she's a big fan. So I said, okay, let's, let's buy you because – you know, this whole experience is so cool. So let's, let's take you to a, a Patriots game. And, and then you also get to see your guy plays. That's, I hope that's an added bonus. Um, in that game, I had, uh, I think I had four catches or something like that. Anyways, I had what should have been two touchdowns. They downed me at the one. Still pisses me off. The rest of the season, I watched every down that the one play, and I did the same exact thing, and they were like, yeah, we should have gave you a touchdown. Mm. But I had one of my best games, and the cool thing about it, not only was she present, but one of my best friends from high school who um, was on the opposite sideline was there, and it was the first time that like I had friends and family and folks I cared for, and I was able to play well, and yes, it was on, you know, Thursday nights, the whole world was watching. So that was just one of the sweet moments where like, I had dreamed that I'd be able to play professional sports with my soon to be wife or with my you know family present, with my boys, my high school best friends, and just have a good game and earn the respect of guys that I respect. So that was in one of my last moments in Indy, it was so sweet because I was trying to mentally process how to handle being cut and in that same breath was also able to have one of my best games and then have a great experience with those that I care about outside of sports. So that was like a kumbaya moment for me. Um, yeah, that was definitely probably one of the sweetest things that I've ever experienced. And I wanted to like play well in front of Gronk and Tom Brady, just keep it real. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just, just be cutthroat honest. So it was just like, yeah, yeah. I let them know I'm, yeah, I can make plays. <laughs> so that one, that one felt good. Um, special. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, outside of that, I mean, there's, I, the list would go on an amount of like hilarity in the locker room and training room and many of goofy stories with Pat and Benny, they probably go on forever and ever and ever. And I love those guys. And they definitely, like I said earlier, they made me feel like one of the guys um even when I was on practice squad sometimes I would watch the game and sit with them 
and um, just to like talk to Adam Vinatieri about his perspective of game flow, even though just as a kicker, but like seeing him have to get ready to make a game winning kick and just like talk to him right up into the moment. He's like, all right, I gotta go. I gotta go be focused. And it's just like, whoa, that's like the greatest of all time <laughs> saying that like, I'm about to do a greatest of all time thing. Wow. And I just sat with him like, good luck, bud. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Give you chills, man. It was, it was a, a lot of very cool behind the scenes stuff. Um, and another thing I also just want to, say this as many times as I can. Like, I thank Chuck Pagano for the way he treats his players because my family still talks about this to this day, but the every day at training camp, if my family was present or if my family wasn't present, he would go and talk to all the players' families, whether it was five minutes, 20 minutes, check up on them, make sure they're good, ask about them, their kids, whatever it was. And he always did that. And my parents grandparents, aunts, uncles, brother, they always, you know, got a chance to sit and speak with him and have genuine, uh, you know, eye to eye locked in conversation. And what that did for, again, me being the shy kid in this new sport um, really made me feel like I was a part of something. So I just, anytime I get a chance to say thank you to, to Chuck, I, I, I try to make sure I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, He's one of the best. Um, I know Colts fans adored him, and it was hard to see him go. But now he, I mean, hell, he just retired. Um, yeah. Spent time with his family, so that's nice. Um, just the last thing I wanted to get um, was if you have any good Pat and Vinny stories, because those are my guys. I'm sure. Um, let's see. Why well, was, let's see. I'm trying to think of Pat and Vinny story. No, they were always doing silly stuff. I'm trying to think of something that would be good. Um, <laughs> just my favorite thing that Pat used to do is he had a very funny relationship with our special teams coach. It didn't matter what the how hot at 8 a.m. at that special teams meeting. Pat was coming in full throttle, telling our special teams coach he's about to beat him up, beat him to a pulp, and he did it every single day. And he would come in, door would slam, wow, Tom, today's the day. And he would do it every single day. And to me, I don't know, I just, I have a good sense of humor. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And he would do that every single time and then one other cool pat memory that i have is actually um after that 2018 or sorry the 2017 season when i was on ir he had a new year's comedy tv or a stand-up that was in downtown indy and uh i reached out to him I was like yeah man i'd love to go to the show and he actually had me as a part of the show and um said some really nice things in front of some you know a lot of fans and stuff like that and he shocked me with that one because he was just, he was having this fun show with magicians and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden I got tied into like the magic and a bunch of random stuff. And he FaceTime called me as I'm walking in and was like, Hey dude, you're going to be a part of the show. So just be ready. Click. And just hung up. And I'm like, I'm sitting with my, fian well, my girlfriend now, fiance. I'm like, um, so Pat said, be ready. So just be ready. <laughs> so that was a, a, a really cool experience. And then Vinny, Vinny, I, Vinny was, <laughs> because Vinny's like 20 years older than me, he's like a father figure. So I always had really good talks with Vinny about just, shoot, I mean, being a man, growing up, understanding what it means to take care of your family and friends, knowing how to take your, uh, the money that you're making in the league and making sure that it lasts long understanding the NFL PA like we had a lot of good talks of course we had a lot of funny silly stuff too don't get me wrong but some of my fondest memories were just like talking to him you know confiding in him for personal things private things that were going on and he said look dude you know we've been there this is you know just understand that you're not the only one that's going through this and you got somebody to talk to and again to have that type of conversation some of it was as a practice squad guy and then some of it was you know when I started playing 
And just knowing that like, as someone that is respected by like the whole sports community, he was a dude that would like take the time to talk to a rookie. It, you know, it was just like worth its weight in gold. And we became very close friends. He, you know, when I was wanting to learn more about ways to take care of my body, you know, he put me in touch with some of the folks that he had always trusted and respected. And I was just like, wow, Adam Vinatieri is like helping me get healthier. Wow. How cool. And um, yeah, I'm just thankful for him. And yeah, he's just, I just always enjoyed watching those two play practical jokes on the special teams coach and do a bunch of silly stuff like that. But I love those guys. And I'm, I think it's cool that Pat um, is willing to be that unfiltered because the stories that you guys, that, you know, you hear on his show, it's just, it's, he's not like putting any extras and then some of them I'll even hear and I'm like, wow, he's really saying that for the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not necessarily like bad things. Like when he was, like his recent one, when he was talking about when he was betting on like Red 18, like, yeah, he had said that story and I just thought it was like locker room talk. And then I like, the other day, I'm like, oh, he just said that story. <laughs> I'm like, hey man, good for you. I'm glad to see all the success he's been having, of course, away from ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. We went way over time. I apologize. Okay. For that. Um, I didn't want to cut you off, but I mean, thank you so much for coming on. This was easily one of my most favorite podcasts. Oh, um, good. I really appreciate you being open and honest and, and coming on, spending time. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Have a good one. Yes, sir. You too. Stay safe. All right.